I'm going to do something a little bit different. If you would just stand with me uh, one more time. And uh, before we go into to scripture and what I feel like the Lord has has brought you this morning, I, I want us to just take a moment and just get our hearts and our minds just in a proper place to receive from him. And so can you, can you just stick both hands in the air with me? We'll just surrender to him for a moment. And with no prompting, no music, nobody telling you what to sing, I want you to just give him the fruit of your lips for just a moment. Can you just begin to speak out praise to the God of the universe? Come on. Come on. Come on. Can you just talk to him like he's in the room? Like he's in the room, not, not like he's so far away that he's untouchable, not like he's so far away that he's unapproachable, but like he's right in front of you. If you don't know anything else to say, right, I know this may be different for you, but if you don't know anything else to say, just say, we love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. God, that you would be glorified in this house. Come on, church. Come on. Come on, let it come from the, from the fruit of your lips. Let it come from the depths of your heart. He's worthy this morning. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, he inhabits the praises of his people. The God of the universe inhabits the praises of his people. God, this morning that you would be glorified over everything else, Father. This morning that you would be glorified, God. God, that your presence would be here. Come on, church. Come on. Come on, man. Come on. Come on. Your life has got to be built on the praise that can come from a deep inner knowing of the graciousness of God, of the goodness of God, of the mercy of God. Is there anything on the inside of you that cries out for the living God? David said, my heart and my flesh cries out. There's something in me and there's something outside of me that cries out for his goodness and his mercy and his grace. Come on. Come on. Can we tell him how good he is for just a moment? Let it come from the depth of your heart. Give him the fruit of your lips this morning. God, you're worthy. Jesus, you're worthy. Holy Spirit, that even now you are just settling in this room. Holy Spirit, that you are settling and you are moving here, God. God, you're reaching into the hearts of men and women, Father. And you're putting your hand on the things that don't belong, God. And you're putting your hand on the things that do belong, God. And you're dividing them in the hearts of men and women right now. God, that you would come and do what only you can do. God, that you would come and speak, that your authority would be here, Father. God, that faith would come forth this morning. God, that you would set people ablaze. God, and we would not live lives satisfied with American Christianity, but, Father, we would lay our lives down before the cross and we would find you. God, in your name, amen. I'm going to ask you to you can be seated. If you have your Bible, you can go to John chapter 9. John 9, uh, it is a, a privilege to be back with you. This is... Uh, one of my my favorite places in the world um, to come, especially this time of year. And so I have an opportunity to, to come here in different areas throughout Virginia throughout the year, and I've become fond of it. So John 9, you just put your finger there, and we're going to go through a couple things um, before I get into the Scripture here. But if I had to give a title this morning to what I feel like the Lord wants to speak to you, is simply he came back seeing. 
A.W. Tozer says that every benefit of the atonement of Christ comes through the gateway of faith. I said it again. Every benefit of the atonement of Christ comes through the gateway of faith. In other words, everything that we receive from Christ going to the cross, into the grave, and out again, we receive it through the gateway called faith. There is no other way for humanity to take part in the sacrifice of the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world except by way of the gateway called faith. Everything that we receive as believers, as Christians, everything comes from the gateway called faith. So then you have to understand that in order for us to properly apprehend that which Christ did, we have to also properly apprehend faith. In order for us to properly receive what Christ did, you have to properly know and activate and use faith. And many people who sit in churches across America proclaiming to have faith have nothing of the sort. Tozer says this. He says, you can't possess faith and have no spiritual fruit. You cannot have faith even in a tiny amount even in a minuscule amount, you cannot have faith and produce no spiritual fruit in your life. You can't have faith in your conduct not change. You can't have faith in your conduct not change. If you got saved 20 years ago and you're the same liar that you were 20 years ago or you're the same gossiper that you were 20 years ago or you're the same fornicator that you were 20 years ago, if you're still the same person that you were on the day that you got saved, you did not receive faith. That wasn't faith. You might have had an emotional experience. You might have cried your eyes out at an altar for two hours, but you didn't get faith if it didn't produce anything in you. And you may very well have spent the last 20 years of your life thinking that you had something called faith, but because it wasn't working in you and it wasn't producing any th fruit out of you, it wasn't faith. No matter how strongly you believed it was, no matter how much you thought what you had was faith, if it didn't do anything, it wasn't faith. At least not the faith of the gospel, at least not the faith of God, at least not the faith required by Jesus Christ. It's not. Tozer says this, anything that makes no change in the man who professes it makes no difference to God either. Anything that doesn't do anything, anything that makes no change in the man who professes it makes no difference to God either. It is an easily observable fact that for many people, the change from no faith to faith makes no actual, actual difference in their life. He says this. He says it's very easily observable that for many people who go from having no faith to claiming that they have faith, it makes no difference in their life. In other words, there's a lot of people who go to an altar who say they had a moment with the Lord and in that moment, they say, I went from having no faith to having faith, and yet it made no difference in their life. They might have signed the card. They might have checked save. They might have even been baptized. But for many people, it's easily observable that that moment of going from no faith to faith didn't produce anything. Tozer says, anything that doesn't make a difference in a man's life makes no difference to God either. The God of the universe is not in the business of doing nothing in humanity. Ever. Ever. We believe in the Christian faith that salvation is when God comes and fills the temple. It's when humanity becomes the dwelling place of the living God. In other words, before you are saved, there is an empty spot that sits in your heart. But when salvation happens, God comes and takes up, takes up residence within the human soul. God, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three come in and reside within a person. And when God takes up residence in humanity, he doesn't ever do so and not produce anything. As a matter of fact, he produces things that are so observable that the people around you begin to look at you and say, I don't even know you anymore. 
And he does it every single time, without exception. That doesn't mean that he does it at the same pace every single time. There are some people who get a lot further in a year than others. There are some people who have gotten a lot further in 10 years than others. But it is easily observable that when God fills the temple, he begins to turn over the tables. When God fills the temple, he begins to turn over the tables. And it's undeniable that he's going to do it every single time. When God fills the temple of your soul, I guarantee you, he's going to begin to turn over the tables. And if there are no tables being turned over in you, if there's nothing being shifted in you, if there's nothing being changed and transformed in you, then God is not filling the temple. Even though you may be sitting here this morning. Faith is not believing of a statement that we know to be true. Faith is not simply collecting the facts. And now that I've got all the facts together, I have faith. It's not faith. Faith believes because God said it, and let that be good enough for me. Faith believes because God said it, and let that be good enough for me. Tozer said, let God be true, and every man a liar is the language of faith. Faith is the confidence in God and his son, Jesus Christ. It is not mere hope. It is not just a collection of facts. It is a miracle of the living God whereby the Holy Spirit brings conviction and the seed of faith planted. Any faith that does not bring our lives to a place of fundamental change is no faith at all. Let me put it to you like this. The man that believes will obey. The man or the woman that believes will obey, period, period. That doesn't mean that there may not be moments where you struggle with obedience, but it does mean that ultimately you will come to a place of obedience. So do not hear anything that I say this morning that says faith should cause you to never deal with sin another day in your life. That's incorrect. But what I'm saying to you is if you are properly apprehending faith and applying faith, then it will deal with the sin in you every time. The man that believes will obey. Failure to obey is convincing proof that there is no faith present. Failure to obey is convincing proof that there is no faith present. Jesus communicates faith this way. He says, if any man would have the faith of a mustard seed, he can say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and it shall be so. He takes faith, this substance called faith, and he boils it down to the tiniest thing that he could reference to where they could understand it. He presents it in a way that you either have faith or you don't, because it's impossible to have less faith than what Jesus said. So this morning, sitting here, as we go through Scripture in John chapter 9, I want you to ask yourself, do you have faith or not? And the way that you can observe the question is simply by examining your life and asking yourself, has my salvation produced anything in me? And is it producing anything around me? Do you have faith this morning, church? Not not American Christianity faith, biblical, proper, supernatural, world-altering, man-transforming faith. Where there is faith, the miracle of God, there is the supernatural change of God, and it's absolutely undeniable. Jesus asked, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? anywhere on the earth. In other words, will there be anyone who carries the miraculous gift of God and this substance called faith? Go to John 9 real quick. You okay? Everybody all right? You okay? Slap your neighbor real quick and see if they're all right. All right. John 9. I know it's 11 o'clock in the morning and I'm making you think, but I won't be here next week, so you can complain to Derek. 9-1 says this. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and he asked his disciples, saying, Rabbi, 
uh, excuse, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, the man or his parents, that he was born blind? Verse 3, Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the, with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Verse 7 said, and he said to them, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Say, he came back seeing. Come on, say, he came back seeing. One more time, he came back seeing. If we were in a black church, I'd say, he came back seeing. <laughs> Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this who, who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. He said, I am he. Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes open? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? And he said, I do not know. A couple of things I want to look at in John chapter 9 as we go through this. Jesus passes a man who was born blind, and his disciples asked a very inter interesting question. They said, who sinned to cause his blindness? Is a man born blind? The Bible later reveals to us that he is of age, so he is an adult. So he's been blind for many years, at least 18 years, 20 years, 30 years. We don't know. We just know he's been born blind, and he's been that way his entire life. And they pass by this man, and the disciples ask the question to Jesus, what caused his blindness? Was it this man's sin, or was it the sin of his parents? Now, you have to see something very interesting in their question. I could go with them. I could maybe go with the disciples in saying that it's possible the sin of the man's parents caused his blindness. That possibly this was some type of generational curse. Possibly there was something that happened in a previous generation that went on to cause the blindness of the man. It's the same way that you have viral diseases that are passed down today, right? Parents pass down AIDS to their children. It's the same concept. Those were decisions that were made in a previous generation that produced a curse in the next generation. This is generational curses. And so I could go with them that maybe, possibly, possibly it was the man's parents' sin that had caused the man to be blind. I don't understand why they would say to Jesus, is it possible that the man caused it himself? Because he was born blind. You don't reap what you sow until you have sown it. In your life, you don't reap what you sow until you have sown it. You may reap some things that your parents have sown. You may have reaped some things that generations before you have sown. But the beauty of God is that the law of sowing and reaping is applied directly to the person sowing. You don't reap what you sow until you have sown it. However, there are many people in your life that will look at you, and they will look at where you're from, and they will look at your family, and they will look at the circumstances that surround you, and they will do everything they can to place things on you before you've even had, to take them, uh, had an opportunity to take them on yourself. It's a great message for teenagers because there's a lot of people who will look at you and say, I know who your mama was, and I know who your daddy was, and I know who your family was, and you don't stand a chance. But it's equally applicable for you because there's some of you that are still running from things that your mama did. There's some of you that have spent 30 years or the vast majority of your adult life doing everything you can to get away from your daddy's name. And there are people who will meet you and immediately place a mantle or a curse on you for something that you didn't even sow or even have the opportunity to sow. Here's the beauty of God, and this is what Jesus says to the disciples. It's not the man's sin. And it's not the parent's sin, but it's for the glory of God. The beauty of God is that he puts a pen in our hand, and he says, I tell you what, why don't you write a different ending? Why don't you write a different story here? Instead of thinking... Instead of thinking that it's your parents' fault, instead of thinking that it's your fault, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to ignore all, ignore all those voices, and I'm going to ignore all those people, and I'm going to literally put a hand, pen in your hand, and I'm going to give you a canvas to write on, and I'm going to tell you, here, why don't you write the story? Why don't you write it out? And not only that, why don't you write it out while I tell you what to write? Why don't you write it out while I tell you what to write down? You can spend the rest of your life doing everything that you can trying to run away from who your family was. 
but you can spend the rest of your life doing everything you can to run away from curses that people put on you that you didn't put on yourself. Or you can simply take the pen of life and you begin to write the story that God whispers in your ear. And I promise you, his whispers will be so much more tender. His whispers will be so much kinder. His whispers will produce so much more direction. His whispers will produce so much more change than all the voices saying he must be blind. He must be blind because it's his fault. Or he must be blind because it's his mama's fault. Or he must be blind because it's his family's fault. When God says of you, you were blind so that I can get in the middle of it and do something. Amen? Go with me back to it real quick. John 9, verse 3. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sin, watch this, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Neither this man sinned or his parents sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. This is the beauty of God, that before the foundation of the earth was laid, he was already setting in motion that which would bring him the most glory in the earth. Before the foundation of the earth was laid, God was already in the process of setting in motion that which would bring him the most glory in the earth. This is what Jesus says to his disciples. He says it wasn't the man's sin, it wasn't his parents' sin, but this was actually a divine act on the, on the, on the intention, with the intention of God to produce supernatural transformation in a moment that would produce glory in the earth. Watch this. The man was blind because God wanted to change him. That's what Jesus said. Who sinned? Him or his parents? He said, neither. But so that you would see the glory of the living God. Let me tell you something, man. There are many of you, and I don't care what age you are, there are many of you who have circumstances that surround your life, and you look at them and you say, I don't understand this. I don't understand why I was born into this family. I don't understand why I was born into this place. I don't understand why I'm from this socioeconomic status. I don't understand why I was born into this culture. I don't understand the circumstances around my life. And a lot of times, it's those circumstances Circumstances that are the things that define you. Circumstances beyond your control will often define you more than anything within your control. Right? Right? But this is the beauty of God. If you would begin to look at those situations and those circumstances and understand that there's coming a day for them, there's coming a day for them when the glory of the living God is going to be revealed right in the middle of them. There's a blind man who's been blind from birth, and the disciples say, whose fault is it? And God takes responsibility, and he says there's coming a day for him when the glory of God is going to be so revealed in him that he'll understand his blindness, his parents will understand his blindness. There's coming a day for you, man, when you will understand why you are in the middle of everything that you are in, because God has this incredible way of getting in the middle of the circumstances and the situation situations around us and putting his hand on them and doing something that only a supernatural living God can do. I'm telling you, man, if you would begin to look at the circumstances in your life and begin to say there's coming a day, if you would start looking at your drug addict daughter that's been lost for five years and you would start to say there's coming a day for you, baby, if you would begin to look at the poverty that you've been born into and you would begin to say there's coming a day for you when the glory of God is going to be so revealed in the middle of this situation that when I come out on the other side, the only explanation will be that God got in the middle of it. You got to change the way that you look at the life around you. You got to change the way that you look at your family. You got to change the way that, they, you, that you look at your prodigal sons and your prodigal daughters. You've got to change it, man. You've got to change it. You've got to change the way that you think about it. You've got to change the way that you talk to it. And you've got to believe that there's glory coming in the middle of it. That the God of the universe is going to show up and he's going to do what only he can do. You've got to begin to speak to it because there's glory coming to it. There's coming a day for you. When Jesus tells the, tells the uh, parable of the prodigal son, he paints the picture that the father is almost daily looking at the horizon. 
But I don't believe that he just went out there and looked. I believe that he spoke to the horizon. And he said, there's coming a day where he's coming over that hill. There's coming a man. If there's some of you, you need to begin to look at the horizon in front of you and say to your son or your daughter or your cousin or your niece or your nephew or your mom or your dad, there's coming a day when you're coming over that hill and God's going to be so glorified in the middle of it. God's going to be so exalted in the middle of it. God's going to be so sovereign in the middle of it. And then I will understand why I had to go through what I had to go through to get to the glory of God. I, I really, I believe there's a grace here right now for prodigal sons and daughters. There's some of you, you've been praying for years, man. She let up, I see. There you, there's some of you been praying for years. There's some of you, you're losing hope and you're starting to say she ain't never coming home. Or he ain't never coming home. I'm telling you, man, start to look at the horizon different. Start to look at the horizon different. There's coming a day. There is coming a day when the glory of God is going to be revealed in the middle of this. She let up, I see. If you're praying for a prodigal son, daughter, niece, aunt, uncle, whatever it is, will you just lift both hands real quick? God, right now, there's a grace here for this, Scott. God, there's a grace here for prodigal sons and daughters, Scott. God, if we declare as a people who are seeking the glory of the living God that there's coming a day when they are coming home, God. God, we declare that there's coming a day when they are coming home. And, Father, we speak right now to, to the horizon, and we say there's coming a day where you're coming over that hill. There's coming a day where you're coming out of it. There's coming a day where you're going to relinquish all of the sin that has dominated your life, all the things that have dominated your life, and you're coming out of it. God, that you would give every heart that is praying for a prodigal son or daughter or family member God the heart of diligence and perseverance to know that there will be a day when the glory of God is revealed in every one of these situations come on just put faith on that for a moment just put faith on that for a moment just believe believe that he's going to be glorified in it Believe that he's going to show up right in the middle of it. And he's going to do what only he can do. You can't do it. Doctors can't do it. Counselors can't do it. Psychiatrists can't do it. AA can't do it. Drug rehab can't do it. But I'm telling you, man, when he gets in the middle of it, when he gets in the middle of it, only thing that will be produced is glory. Holy Spirit, give us faith to believe that prodigal sons and daughters are coming home. God intends to redefine what has defined you. And God is most glorified in the redefining of humanity. When he takes a sinner and makes them a saint and places them back into a sinful world and keeps them a saint, it produces glory. It produces glory. The greatest testament of the divine reality of God is the supernatural transformation of humanity. Whereby in a moment, the drug addict doesn't want the drug anymore. Where in a moment the alcoholic doesn't want the drink anymore. Where in a moment the fornicator doesn't want the pornography anymore. Where in a moment God doesn't. And you say, well, if I didn't have it in a moment, does that mean that I don't have faith? No. Just hold on to the cross, man. Just hold on to the cross and apply faith to it. And I promise you there will be a day where you so, so want the things of God more than you want the things of the world. Look at verse 6 real quick. Verse 6, when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. I wonder, I wonder how many people had prayed over the blind man in his life. I wonder when he was born and his parents discovered that he was blind, how many times they went to the synagogue or they went to the temple 
And they said to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, can you heal him? These people still believed in the miracles of God. They had an entire, it wasn't an Old Testament to them, but they had an entire description of their history to this point that had talked about the miracles of God. I wonder how often they prayed to God and said, God, heal him, heal him. But Jesus in this moment spits in the dirt. And you have to see the narrative here. Don't, don't treat it like a, like a story because then you'll gloss over it. It's a narrative. It's a historical account of an actual event. So see the scene. There's a blind man who can probably hear the disciples talking about him. There's a crowd around Jesus. We don't know how many are actually there. And then there's Jesus. They're in a region of the world that's very dry. It's desert. And the Bible says that he spits into the dirt and he makes clay. Let me ask you a question. How much spit does it take to make clay? Now, you're going to have to go back to your childhood real quick when you were making mud pies, right? It took more than a couple. We like to read this and just think Jesus just, and then he made some clay, right? I imagine, just in my own thinking of how this worked, he probably stood there and spit for a while. How much clay does it take to cover up a man's eyes? Right? This wasn't like a little black under his eyes like he was about to go play a football game. This could have been mud cakes. You don't know how it worked. This dude could have had just straight mud on his eyes just like that. But Jesus standing there, I imagine he probably hit a couple. <laughs> With the blind man sitting there. He's a blind beggar. I guarantee you he's been spit on before. He knows what that sound means. Get ready to dodge, right? You got to read this thing, man. And don't, don't gloss over it. Put yourself there. What if you were the blind man? There's somebody hocking up loogies outside of you. You'd be a little bit nervous. The Bible says that Jesus spits in the clay. Watch the prophetic picture here. He spits into the dirt, and he makes clay, he makes mud. The creator reaches into the creation, pulls out the creation, and places it on the creation. I wonder how many people prayed for the blind man and saw nothing. I really wonder if his eyes were, in fact, waiting on the clay. I wonder if his eyes were waiting for that moment, and I believe this is what Jesus communicates in verse 3, but that this man's eyes were waiting for the moment when the Creator stood before him and took the creation and rubbed it on. The Bible describes the relationship of the potter and the clay. Jeremiah talks about the relationship of the potter and the clay, of molding. This is a moment for the Creator who has stepped into time who has stepped into the natural world, and he's doing in the natural what he's been doing in the supernatural since the foundation of the earth was laid. This was not a new thing for Jesus. He spent the whole of human existence molding the clay. And you got to see the prophetic picture here. The blind man's eyes were waiting on the potter to come and fix the imperfection in the clay. Here's the beauty of this. We don't know how long the man waited. We don't know how old he was. We know he was of age. He was an adult. We don't know how long the man waited. But there was a day when the clay showed up for him. There are many of you sitting here who feel as if you are the blind man waiting on clay. The beauty of Christ's sacrifice and the new covenant that he establishes tells us that unlike the blind man, we are not waiting on the clay any longer. As a matter of fact, Christ turned the tables and actually the clay is waiting on you. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. This man might have spent 18, 20, 25, 30 years waiting for the clay to show up. 
Most of us live our lives waiting for the clay to show up, missing the fact that on the cross, the clay showed up. The clay showed up on the cross. And with every stripe that was placed on his back, there was clay available. And with every nail that went through his hands, there was clay available. And with every drop of blood that fell to the ground, it mixed with the clay that was available. And now it is readily available in your life for those who would have the faith to believe it, who would have this substance called faith, to believe and apprehend that there is clay available for you. Your healing is waiting for faith to apprehend it. Your deliverance is waiting for faith to apprehend it. The clay is literally waiting on you. The man may have spent 20 years waiting for the clay to show up, but you don't have to spend another moment in your life waiting for the clay to show up. You simply have to take this supernatural thing called faith and begin to apply it to your life and to the circumstances of your life and simply believe that 2,000 years ago the clay got on a cross for you. And the blood that fell was more than enough to cover every sin, every stain, every sickness, every imperfection, and to bring deliverance in your life. You've got to change the way that you look at Jesus. You've got to change the way that you look at life, man. And understand there's a supernatural God waiting to supernaturally intervene in your life. And he's already provided everything that you need for him to intervene. Amen. Here's the beauty of this picture. Jesus applies clay to the blind man. The blind man did not see it coming. I'll leave that there for a second. Think about it. You'll get it in a second. Think about it. Oh, well, there's one. <laughs> the blind man didn't see the clay coming. As a matter of fact, after hearing a man spit in the dirt, he thought something very different was coming. This is the great reality of Christianity. And this is the great hope for you as you pray for people who are lost, as you pray for prodigal sons and daughters, they don't have to see it coming. Friend, you don't have to get them to church. You say, my daughter ain't never coming to church. Don't worry about it. My son, he ain't never going to darken the do doors of a church. Man, he don't have no chance to get saved. He didn't have to see it coming. Come on, you're missing it. He didn't have to see it coming. The blind man never saw the clay coming. The clay in a moment showed up in his greatest moments of blindness. This is the beauty of God, that in our greatest moments of lostness, of blindness, the clay still shows up for us. I don't care how far gone they are. I don't care how deep in sin they are. I don't care how lost they are. I don't care if they hadn't been to church in 30 years. I don't care, man, if they're the most evil, sinful, lost person that you know. They don't have to see the clay coming. They don't have to see it coming. They don't have to darken the doors of a church. A missionary doesn't have to show up to them. A prophet doesn't have to show up to them. A pastor doesn't have to show up to them. But if you will be diligent and faithful in the seeking, then the supernatural God of the universe has the ability to show up in the middle of the pig trough and show to the son that it sure was better in my father's house. It sure was better where I came from. Stop thinking that you got to get them in church. Just begin to believe that he's supernatural and he is capable of transforming things in a natural world that he spoke into existence. Stop hoping they'll see it coming, man. Just start praying it knocks them over. Just start praying it knocks them over, man. Start praying that right in the middle of their dorm room, God's presence fills the room, and they don't have any other explanation except that God has done something. Start praying that right in the middle of their job, man, that God's presence, that right in the middle of the bar, God's presence will show up. That right in the middle of the drug addict's house, that the presence of the living God would show up and would begin to transform them and would begin to change them. Just understand, they don't have to see it come. 
either he's a supernatural living God or he's not. If he's not a supernatural living God, then you've got to figure out how to get him through those doors. But if he is the creator of the universe and a supernatural God, then all you have to do is lift up petition before him, and he'll work it out, and he'll figure it out. God plants the supernatural seeds of faith in us while we are in our greatest moments of blindness. You don't have to have this whole thing figured out. You can be blind, and he begins to put his hand on you. And in a moment, you can be transformed. Watch this. Verse 7 says this. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Say so he came back seeing. So he went and washed, and he came back seeing. It's a very interesting thing to send a blind man anywhere. You ain't read this. You've read through it, but you ain't read it. You ain't read it. Jesus, the clay didn't fix the blindness. I know you're like, Pastor, that undoes all that stuff you just preached. No, no, no. Understand the prophetic picture of what's going on here. Jesus puts clay on the man's eyes, and it doesn't do anything. And then he tells a blind man, who's still blind, by the way. Not only is he blind, he's got mug cakes on his eyes. And he tells a blind man, go. Go to the pool of Siloam, which means sent. He sends a blind man to a place called sent. The Bible doesn't tell us that he sends anyone with the blind man. The Bible doesn't tell us that the disciples go with him. The Bible doesn't tell us that Jesus leads him. The Bible doesn't tell us that there were people standing around saying, yes, I will walk with this blind man with mud on his eyes to this pool. No, he just tells the blind man, get up and go. I imagine the disciples are pretty disappointed that the clay didn't work. I imagine the crowd that is standing around Jesus watching this happen are pretty disappointed that it didn't work. They've seen this dude do some pretty incredible things. So when he starts to spit in the dirt and he starts to make clay and he starts to put it on the eyes of a blind man, they're like, oh, something's about to happen. And then nothing. As a matter of fact, Jesus ends the whole charade and tells the blind dude, hey, why don't you get up and go? See the prophetic picture. He tells a blind man to go to a place called Sent. And I don't know anything else about the blind man except I know he went. I don't know anything else about the blind man except I know he went. We don't know how far from the pool the blind man was. Not only that, he could have been inches from the pool and not known it. The blind man doesn't know where his destination is outside of asking people where it is. Get this picture. There is a man who's been blind from birth with mud on his eyes. And the Bible literally paints the picture that he then goes at the word of Jesus alone and stumbles through a city trying to find a place called Sent. But he goes. But he goes, church, I don't know how long he went. I can't tell you that he found it that day. I can't tell you that he found it the next day. I can't tell you that he found it in the first four days. I can't tell you that he found it that week. I can't even tell you that he found it that month. All I know is that the blind man went to a place called Sent, and at some point he found it. And it paints the picture of a man literally crawling along the walls of a city. Come on, you got to see the narrative here. Literally crawling along the walls of a city. Literally pushing past. He's a beggar man and he's blind. Do you, I wonder how many people knocked him over on the journey. I wonder how many people told this stupid beggar to get out of the way. I wonder how many people threw him back on the dirt. I wonder how many times he had to crawl across the ground to find this place called sin. I wonder how many times he took a wrong turn to find this place called sin. But there's one thing. 
thing that I do know about the blind man, and that is at some point he found scent. At some point he found the pool. At some point he found where Jesus had sent him. And the Bible tells us that he fell headlong into the pool, and the Bible says he went, he washed, and he came back seeing. In the prophetic picture, you have to see a couple of things here. Number one, the vast majority of people who are sent are not willing to stumble through the city. The vast majority of people who are sent are not willing to send, stumble through the city. At the first sign of opposition, at the first wrong turn, first time somebody knocks them down, they're done with going to this place called sent. But the blind man stumbles. And he crawls his way and he climbs his way. And at some point he finds the pool. The Bible said he went, he washed, and he came back seeing. There are many who have gone, but they stopped there and didn't wash. And so they never came back seeing. There are many who have gone, and they washed. Or, or there were many who have gone, and they stopped there and didn't wash, and they never came back seeing. Church, this morning, the goal for us in the Christian faith is not that we would go. It's that we would wash and come back seeing. It's that we would wash and we would come back seeing. Pastor, you want to know why you can't get people to show up for prayer meeting? Because they haven't come back seeing. Why well, we only come to church once a month or twice a month, and even then we show up late? Because we haven't come back seeing yet. Why well, we don't lay hands on the sick and expect for them to recover because we haven't come back seeing yet. You want to know why you won't get up in the morning and pray and seek the face of God because you haven't come back seeing yet. You may have gone. You may have gone for a while. You may have stumbled through the city for a while. But at some point, you didn't find the pool. And you didn't fall into it. And you didn't wash. And you didn't come back seeing. If there's one thing that you will know about a blind man who has found sight, if there's one thing that you will know about a dead man who's found life, you will know that they are suddenly alive. You will know that they are suddenly alive. And we won't have to beg you to show up for prayer meeting. We won't have to wonder if you're going to show up in the summer. But if you wash and you come back seeing, then the fact that you suddenly can see becomes the perspective that you view everything in your life. Everything in your life. And everything becomes subject to the fact that you suddenly can see. Church, have you washed? And have you come back seeing? Have you been so transformed that you went from being a blind man or a blind woman that now you see the world as you have never seen it before? If you ever see the world as you have never seen it before, I guarantee you there will be a level of excitement and there will be a level of zeal and there will be a level of desire and there will be a level of clearing yourself and there will be even a level of fear. There will be a level of understanding. If you ever go from being blind to seeing, you will say, I never want to be blind another moment in my life. You will say, I don't want to spend another day as a dead man. And I'm telling you, man, if you ever go to the cross into the grave and out again, you'll never want to go back to the grave. If you ever go with Jesus Christ to the cross, into the grave and out again, and you begin to properly see him in light of his glory, in light of your sin, and you begin to see all the things that faith can actually do in the world around you, you will never be satisfied with a life that is absent of faith. You'll never be satisfied with a life that's lived in a tomb. You'll never be satisfied with being blind again. But there are so many people who come to our altars and they come to our services and for some reason they are so satisfied with blindness that we can't get them to show up. This is American Christianity. That across this country this morning, there are millions of blind people who are sitting in chairs and pews who are perfectly satisfied with being blind. 
perfectly satisfied with spending their life leaning against the wall as a beggar being blind because it's too much trouble to stumble through a city and find the place called sin. It's too hard, brother. It's too much required. It takes too much. It's going to take too long. I'm going to have to rearrange my life. Don't you understand that we watch football? Don't you understand we got to go to lunch? Brother, quit preaching, sit down, and let's go on with it. But across this country, millions of people who proclaim to have faith and have no evidence for the faith that they proclaim are perfectly satisfied with sitting in a pew and sitting on a chair and being blind. Perfectly satisfied. And there's some of them that are so good at it. They're deacons and they're elders and they're pastors and they're youth pastors and they're worship leaders and they're prophets and they're evangelists and they're apostles or they're just normal church people. But they're all blind all the same. I don't know if you've ever witnessed, I don't know if you've ever witnessed a person who went from death to life in a moment, who found the pool and washed and suddenly came back seeing. But it is a miraculous, glorious sight. And if the doors are locked, they'll figure out a way to get in. Is there any zeal in your faith? friends is there any desperation for the things of God is there any desire to see him supernaturally transform the world around you is there any desire to see him supernaturally transform you or are you perfectly okay being blind because stumbling through the city is not a real good proposition for you Church, I said it before, I don't know anything else about the blind man except that I know he found the pool. I don't know how long it took him to get there, but I know he got there. And I know he went and he washed. And he came back to see one last thing on this and then I'm finished. Look back with me. Verse 8 says this, watch this. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? Watch this, verse 9. Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But the man said, I am he. Therefore they said to them, How were your eyes opened? And he answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? And he said, I do not know. Look back at verse 9. Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. And he said, I am he. If you continue reading John chapter 9, you will find that the greatest difficulty for the blind man after he has received his sight is to actually convince people that he had been blind. If you keep reading, his parents disown him. The Pharisees cast him out. And the greatest difficulty for the man is to actually convince people that he had been blind. The transformation in the man was so great that the people around him would not even accept that he had been the man previously blind. The transformation in the man was so great that his parents were even afraid of the Pharisees to proclaim that this was their son and he in fact had been blind and was now healed. The transformation that you claim to have, that point that you went from no faith to faith, did it produce in you such a change that you even had difficulty convincing people that you were the person that they knew? Or are you simply the person that they knew? And ultimately, this supernatural transformation that the cross produces within a human life is not real enough in you for people around you to recognize that you have, in fact, been to the cross, into the grave. And out again. The greatest difficulty for us, 
once we have received sight, should be convincing people that we were the blind man. But for too many people, they claim to receive sight, but they still look and sound like the blind man. Where are you, church? Where are you this morning? As many of you would say, I have faith. I have faith. You'd even claim to have the faith of a mustard seed that can say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and it shall be so, but you don't believe any of that. Have you went? Have you washed? Have you come back seeing? And is it so evident in your life that you even have difficulty convincing people who once knew you as a blind man or a blind woman that you were indeed at one point blind? But now the sight that you have and the life that you have has so overcome who you once were. Stand on your feet. We hope this message has been a blessing to you today. When you are in our area, please consider joining us in person off exit 98 at One Harvest Place across from Walmart in Dublin.